Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure, also known as CES. <laughs> I haven't said that for a while, have I? Um, looking forward to the Bible study tonight. Uh, we are continuing the study of the book of Galatians, and tonight we're beginning chapter four. So get your Bibles ready, and we'll get started in a minute. Let's say hello to the, the congregation, Sister Renee. Yeah. Uh, hey, guys, I missed you all uh, last week. It's kind of ironic because I kept thinking we were on Galatians 3 for weeks, and then the week we are on it, I miss. <laughs> Gracious. Mm. So I am looking forward to discussing that with you guys. All right. Thank you, sister. All right. Uh, Brother Cripps, will you give a greeting to the congregation? Yes, it's Wednesday, and uh, that means Bible study time, which I look forward to every week. And I'm excited uh, to continue in Galatians. I've enjoyed it so far. I'm glad to have Renee back. But I have to say, I enjoyed uh, having Ben with us last week and filling in. Uh, so looking forward to tonight. Hello to everyone in the chat, and um, can't wait to get started. Amen. Yes. Uh, Brother Ben, uh, I... You, you said you didn't know if you could, you didn't think you could fill uh, Sister Renee's high heels, but you did, <laughs> you, you did an excellent job. So Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Actually, this uh, yeah. time you said, uh, you said something about clothing rather than riches. Shoes. Riches. Yeah, riches, right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's good to be here. I'm looking forward to the, uh, to the study and the things, the inspiration, inspired things that you guys are going to reveal to us all. <laughs> awesome. That looks too funny. Awesome. Okay. Well, with no further ado, let's get started. Uh, we'll go to Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. We'll begin with the KJV. It says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant though he be uh, Lord of all, verse 2, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Sister Renee? Yeah, this is a uh, metaphor that Paul is using. When a child inherits his father's wealth, let's say a prince, right, is next in line to the kingdom. If he is the only living heir, he is actually Lord over everything and everyone, but he's too immature to be able to actually step up into the place of rulership. And so uh, Paul is using this here and he says, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Uh, and then he, you will see how he uses this metaphor because in the, in the first verse it says, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. So technically he is ruler over everyone and everything, but he doesn't have the capacity to understand it or to step up to that position. But if you go back, you know, these chapter divisions are not inspired and they often confuse us. But if you go back to the last chapter, it ends with them saying there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise then he goes into saying and the heir as long as he is a child differs nothing uh though he be lord of all but is under tutors and governors till the time appointed of the father so it's his way of saying under the old covenant they were as children and didn't have full understanding of it nor did they have understanding of their position as heirs with christ because they were still children lacking understanding. Hey, so guys. I hope uh, you continue that. Uh, real quick, Luke and Cripps, uh, your, both your microphones are really sensitive. So if you're going to be moving around at all, give, if you could just mute during that time, um, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't think I had moved at all. I, didn't, I didn't. moved at all. It was sitting, sitting perfectly still. Okay. Well, you, well, uh, I heard like there's. It took over the screen like it, like it was your your shuffling or whatever movement was going on was overtaking Renee a little bit. So it actually like it just it showed your icon instead of hers. So who, I don't. Who, who, you who is it? Me or Crips? I would say well, it was mostly Crips, but um, it's again if you could just mute if you think you're going to be moving substantially all right. at all, that'd be helpful. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Um, all right, let's go to uh, Brother Cripps. Let's let's look at this in the Amplified before you comment. Uh, it, verse 1 and 2 in the Amplified says, Now what I mean when I talk about children and their guardians is this. As long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, even though he is the future owner and master of all the estate. But he is under the authority of guardians and uh, and household administrators or managers until the date set by his father, when he is of legal age. Uh, before you comment, uh, let me add to what Renee said. She said, I, "Did you say the sub the titles of the chapters or the uh, chapter numbering were you were not inspired? What were you referring to?" I said the chapter divisions. Oh, okay. Were put there by men. Yeah, that's why I thought you said. Well, I want to mention that uh, the uh, many of the translations, uh, the uh, translators and publishers insert titles and subtitles in the chapters. So that in the Amplified, the subtitle reads Sonship in Christ. And in the NABRE, this, they, they've chosen a sub, I mean, a title for the, this portion of scripture is God's free children in Christ. So that they're trying to put basically in a few words a theme for the following verses all right brother Cripps, why don't you begin okay well first of all um i think i said last week uh you know something that we have uh, noticed a couple times is exactly what you're talking about which is whether a, a chapter is should have been continued or not or at least what the writer is uh, was talking about last chapter is continuing, and that's exactly what Paul's doing. And Renee did a really good job of explaining this. I really can't add a whole lot, but I can add. I, I feel uh, like this tells us why we're here. Like uh, if if we were saved as children and were joint heirs with Christ, then we went right into eternity. We'd have no learning and no experience to to go from. I, I feel like we learn. Uh, as believers, we learn a lot in this world. Uh, I've heard some people refer to it as as uh, this this world as a class. You know, it's like a, a it's like a school that we learn from. I don't know if that's true or not. But that's what it seems like to me. the The, the verses definitely mean what Renee said they mean. Uh, I would agree with the way that she presented, it, but I couldn't help thinking about um, the reason why we're here in the first place. One of the many reasons we're here to give glory to God, obviously. But why do we have to go through all this, all this turmoil and all this strife and all this learning that we do from life? Um, and I, I just had the thought, what, what would it be like if we learned nothing? If we just uh, uh, were, were children, were saved, and then all of a sudden we're in heaven, ruling and reigning with Christ as children without any understanding. Just a thought. That's not like babes in Christ, don't they, Chris? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, well, I'm trying to figure out where it's going to go um, uh, next with this, but um, I believe this is referring to the believer, but um, it's talking about the believer being a child, but the, the standing as a child, um, I don't think anybody could be called a child uh, until um, the... Um, the church age that that's that's when we are, can officially be a child we're born again spiritually and that new birth is makes us a child of god and until pentecost there were was not a new birth um there was the people who had faith waiting for the finished work of christ and the holy spirit so um uh, this is i think this is um I'm not sure if this is talking about individuals yet or, or the, the church as a whole in terms of uh, 
this status as a child. Remember in the last chapter, it talked about being a, being a, a child or a child of God or a son of God. And we were talking about how uh, you're not, you're not a child of God unless you're, you're born again. The rest of the world is really, the Bible says a child of the devil. So here, now I think it's going to elaborate a little further about this idea of being a child, but it's saying when you are a child, though, that uh, and until a certain time, you still need uh, a tutor. Uh, so I'm not sure what it's getting to because I haven't looked ahead uh, yet, but let's see if there's any footnote that will help, be helpful. Um, it says in the NABRE verses 1 through 7, uh, the, the, what Paul has argued in Galatians 3, 26 through 29, uh, for through faith you are all children of God in Christ Jesus, for all of you who are, were baptized, okay, uh, that's what it's re referencing, uh, it is now elaborated in terms of the Christian as the new heir, uh, freed from control by others, again, as in Galatians 3, 2 through 5, that says, I want to learn only this from you. Did you receive the spirit from works of the law or from, okay. Um, again, uh, the, the proof that Christians are children of God is the gift of the spirit of Christ relating them intimately to God. All right, so. All right, I, I'm, I'm not really I'm real confident to say any more about this until we get, go a little further. Um, all right, any more from either of you before we continue on? All right, let me go back to the KJV, read verse 3. I'm going to read 3, 4, and 5. It looks like it's one thought here, the way they punctuated it. It says, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Brother Chris? Yeah, yeah, that, those are some good verses right there. Three, four, and five. Verse three, uh, he's talking about the state. Paul's talking about the state in which they were in. Um, he calls it bondage, which I would agree. We're uh, in bondage to to both sin and the law that was put on us, uh, as Renee says many times, to shut our mouth, uh, to let us also know that we need a Savior. Uh, call, uh, Paul calls that bondage. The elements of the world just means the circumstance. To me, it means circumstances of the time. And then verse four, but when the fullness of time was come, when it came time for God to do what he did by sending his son, God sent forth uh, Jesus, made of a woman, made under the law. So he was born into the same world that we were born into, had not yet accomplished what he was, would uh, then come to accomplish. And uh, uh, also to, to keep in mind that some of the scriptures that, he said, or some of the comments that he made to other people were made from a person under the law because he hadn't died yet. Uh, uh, number uh, Verse 5, to redeem them that were under the law, that's all of us, all of them at the time. Uh, as uh, Brother Luke had mentioned, those people that were looking forward to the Messiah, that's probably what they, what they called it or what they heard. Uh, some people might have said Redeemer. Of course, it was, it was done in Aramaic or other languages, not in English, but that's the similar meaning that we might receive adoption of sons. That's what Paul has talked about in previous verses that were adopted. Uh, there's a couple of weeks ago now, we, but uh, Paul made it very clear what the process was for when we become saved and, and what that makes us. We're, we're adopted in the family of Christ. So Paul's referring to that here in verse five. So good stuff. Good three verses. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Uh, Sister Renee, verses three, four, yeah. and five. Uh, amen, Chris. Uh, I wanted to point out here, Paul, oh, when he talks about elements, we're under bondage in the elements of the world. He describes this in another book this way. Taste not, touch not, handle not, right? These were childhood training, all right? 
these were, I think somewhere he calls it weak and beggarly elements. Same thing when he says the elements of the world. It means things that are carnal of the flesh. That's why in the other book, he says, uh, those that are uh, in the flesh, mind the things of the flesh. And that's what he's talking about. Circumcision, not e eating ritual hand washings, taste not, touch not, handle not. This was training pants. Okay. And that's why he says, uh, when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. This is why I do not understand why when we're told we're complete in Christ, they go back to these weak and beggarly elements of taste, not touch, not handle, not keeping the food laws, circumcision, all kinds of Hebrew Old Testament uh, uh, carnal, I call them carnal ordinances, things that have to do with fleshly things. And, and they're not really spiritual, but they think they're making them more spiritual. And so it tells us right here, this was uh, us as children in those carnal ordinances. We should realize our sonship, our joint heirs with Christ by faith because we're complete in him. So to go back to these elements uh, brings us back to childhood. It's like we didn't understand or grow up from it. If we went back to the shadows instead of the actual image of the things to come. And so even we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Taste not, touch not, handle not. That's how I remember with the elements. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of son. So the law served its purpose. Christ was born under the law, fulfilled that law, and we are complete in him. And so we're joint heirs by faith in Christ, not through these weak elements, these carnal hand washings and eating certain things and abstaining and, and, and fleshly rituals like circumcision. This is not what, these are childish, childhood rituals until the fullness of time had come. So we could grow up into maturity and realize our inheritance. And so uh, it's amazing to me how many people think there's wisdom in going back to this old covenant. But in reality, Paul here is telling us that's a childhood. We should have outgrown that, realized our completeness in Christ and, and moved on. Not not look back to these elements. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to read it in the Amplified. Uh, it's verse 3, 4, and 5 says, uh, So also we, whether Jews or Gentiles, when we were children, that is spiritually immature, were kept like slaves under the elementary, uh, man-made religious or philosophical teachings of the world. But when in God's plan, the proper time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the regulations of the law, so that he might redeem and liberate those who are under the law, that we who believe might be adopted as sons, as, that is, as children, God's children with all rights as fully grown members of a family. Well, it, it seems to me, though, that the, the reference to the child here in the beginning, um, if the Amplified is um, amplifying it correctly, uh, that they're you're immature, they're, so they, they have to be under the law, uh, and the time hasn't been come yet for the, the full message of the gospel to be revealed. Yep. Uh, but uh, so, but it refers to the, before that the people as children. They, they're immature because they they were maybe not ready to understand or not, not able to understand this at that time. Uh, but I wanted to back up for a second because I noticed that in in verse two in the KJV it says until the time appointed of the Father, um, and it says in the uh, Amplify it says. Uh, until the date set by his father. Um, 
Now, the reason I'm thinking that this is something we need should talk about is, is because, um, you know, we 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 have a uh, sect of Christians that uh, uh, I have a lot of issues with. We call them Calvinists, or they call themselves Calvinists. You know, Paul says, "Don't identify with Apollos or Cephas or Paul," or, and yet these people choose to identify with John Calvin instead of with Christ. So they, they start off all wrong by uh, elevating this man and his teachings too much. But uh, in Calvinism, they could take this verse here and uh, say it's the appointed time and um, take this concept to, uh, de- to uh, promote their view of determinism and that, uh, that, that things are determined by God and um, I, I don't believe that God determines all things. I think there are times where God does um, in, insert himself and impose his will to accomplish something um, because he is sovereign. Um, the uh, Calvinists are right in th- saying that God is sovereign, even though that word's not in the Bible. Uh, but he's not sovereign the way a Calvinist defines it. A Calvinist th- thinks that sovereignty of God means that God actually determines everything, actually controls every thought, word, and deed, and every movement of every molecule, and God is and, and is that intricately involved. Uh, and uh, that that's not the sovereignty of God. Um, if that was the case, the problem with it, it would be that uh, that means that the only really guilty party in, in, in the fall of Satan, the fall of Adam and Eve, and in all of our sin, the only truly guilty party would be God because God is controlling us, making everybody do all these sins. So that's where that problem uh, falls, that, that uh, viewpoint uh, falls apart. It makes God into a, an evil uh, puppet master. Um, but what does it mean if it's a appointed time? Um, I believe that... Uh, um, you know the word moment um how many moments uh elapse in this last five seconds i how small a portion can we slice this time well whatever small slice we put let's take a picture of a snapshot and then another one another one another one and then let's string them together and put them on a reel and speed it up and you have a, a moving picture uh and i think that we are living in each moment, and we don't see the the beginning of the story and the end of the story and every picture along the way. But God, being outside of time, he can look and see the entire picture, every single photo, every moment. He knows what's going to happen. So I believe the time is appointed, because this is talking about the appointed time for Jesus to come into the world. That's what this is uh, meaning about the appointed of the Father. Uh, so my question is, did, did, did the Lord declare and mandate that Jesus would come on uh, the date he did? Or did God simply know what time it was with his foreknowledge and, and gave it the, the information to Daniel in his 70 weeks of years? That prophecy shows that it was predicted to the very day that Jesus would come and begin his ministry. Um, and so that's the appointed time I think this is referring to here. So did God appoint it at, or let's say mandate it and determine it? Or did God tell us in the scriptures that this is the way it is? He knows it. And see, so he told us what, how it would happen. That's the question. All right. Anyone want to respond to that or anything before we go on? Yeah, uh, real quick on the Calvinist thing. The only thing is, though, is Paul is using it as a metaphor. Like in earthly terms, a child could be an heir to a great empire, but he's no greater than a servant because he doesn't understand or comprehend or is unable to even understand what his inheritance is or how to how to really needs to grow up. And so for them, if they were to use that as predetermination, I, I do believe there are moments in time that God predetermines. Like he told us when Christ, when he would send Jesus, like you said in the book of Daniel. But I, I think it's clear in scripture that every person, God gives them a choice. 
he even said to Jerusalem how I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her, her, her chicks, but you would not. You wouldn't. And so uh, I think there's plenty of places in scripture where man does have a choice. Uh, and I think that this foreknowledge, the elect according to the foreknowledge of God, is not God uh, choosing certain people. It's God foreknowing the choices of those people. He knows the end from the beginning, and he works within that. Um, otherwise, we, we would not be responsible. And there's many places where he gives a choice. Choose life. I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. He's always telling us to choose. Whosoever will. So uh, Calvinism is completely offensive to me. Yeah, what well, your, your point about the metaphor, I think you're referring to the part of these scriptures that refers to the, the word child. And, uh, yeah. and um, uh, as you and the Amplified put it, that this term child means that they were immature, not ready for this revelation yet, I guess. Um, but when I use the word child, uh, and I, okay, words don't always mean the same thing. So it doesn't mean that it has to mean what I'm saying. But I, when I say child, I'm saying that nobody has been a child of God until they're born again. But this is referring to people as a child in the sense that they are childlike in their understanding. I think. Right, right, right. Okay. But what about the determination of the, um, um, when it says um, the appointed, uh, the time appointed of the father, and uh, when it says, uh, when the fullness of t the time was come, um, this is uh, God sent forth his son at that time. So uh, God sent Jesus at the, at the time that was appointed. And when the fullness of time was come, that's when God sent the son. Uh, but my point is that uh, uh, in this case, it really wouldn't matter because God being sovereign, he, he can uh, uh, decree it and make it happen whenever he wants. But but I, I tend to believe that most of the time we should think of this in terms of God revealing to his, us his foreknowledge rather than God um, uh, mandating something and controlling all things by, by the appointed time. Uh, all right. Any more, uh, Renee or Cripps, before I move on? Okay, let's go to verse uh, uh, 6 in the KJV. Uh, who's going first this time? I think it's Renee, right? Yeah, it's Renee. Uh, and because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Sister Renee? All right, sorry, we got uh, Mike McGregor. Keeps texting me. I'm trying to let him know I'm live. I can't deal with it right now. All right, let me see. All right. So, and because ye are sons. Now, this is what I don't get about people. Clearly, Jesus tells us the son, a son, abides in the house forever. So I don't understand why people say you can lose salvation. Be, this right here says, because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And we know he'll never leave us or forsake us. A son abides in the house forever. And so I think the whole point of this is that nobody is a child of God by the law or by carnal ordinances, such as food laws and circumcision he's trying to show them that all those things had their purpose they were shadows they were for us as we were children but now we have the spirit of god himself convicting us of the truth that we are his children what happened I'm sorry, I got, I got, I was a little distracted. Uh, 
I see some kind of political discussion going on in the chat room. I might ask everybody to please uh, focus on this, this study. Uh, and any given time on the church program, I'm asking everybody to leave politics uh, out of the church discussions, if you will. Um, all right, let me see. Okay, Crips, let me read verse 6 in the Amplified for you. It says, and because you really are his sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Praise God. <laughs> because we really are sons. So uh, I like what Renee said. You know, why do why do people struggle uh, with the idea of remaining in the house forever? I mean, that, that may, there's several verses that make it, no one will take us out of his hand. Nothing can... Nothing can, uh, nothing can separate us from the love of God, what Paul says, and he names a bunch of things. Uh, so that it's it's super clear. I, I agree with that. Uh, thank you for that, Renee. Um, so this one again, uh, he referenced this uh, a couple of verses up about the adoption, the idea of adoption. So when we become believers, when we accept uh, his free gift of salvation. We're considered sons. We're joint heirs with Christ. And we call him father. This is basically Paul saying, you can call out to him father. He's, he's our father now. Uh, he's also God. He, uh, he, he's a lot of things, just as Christ is a lot of different things to us. Uh, he's, our, he's our brother. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. He's our Redeemer. On and on and on it goes. He has many different uh, purposes and, and, and names. Uh, but in this case... Uh, Paul saying, yes, now uh, we're adopted sons and daughters. He, he doesn't say that, but it's sons and daughters. We're all the same, as he pointed out uh, in the last chapter. Uh, there's no uh, Jew or Greek or there's no, no separation any other way. We're adopted sons and daughters. So that's all he's saying, and, uh, I believe. We're members of the family, he says in the verse above, as God's children with all the rights and fully grown members of his family. All right. Okay. Uh, maybe you, you're uh, you're going to realize that uh, as I look at the scriptures, things stand out to me that may not be um, as interesting or as um, important to other people, I guess. But uh, uh, I'm I'm always very sensitive to the the phrases and verses that um, people use to uh, twist the gospel. So I can see here, uh, uh, verse six says, and because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out a father. Um, now there's another verse that says, um, if you, uh, confess with your mouth and believe with your heart, uh, then, uh, and uh, another verse that says, if you believe with your whole heart. Um, so it, it, it is certainly true and, and valid to say that Jesus, uh, the spirit comes into your heart. Actually, it says that right here, doesn't it? It says, uh, because you are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of the son into your hearts. So it's not invalid to uh, say and teach and believe that the spirit goes into your heart. But, of course, we know that the heart is not, and it's referring to here, is not your uh, the organ that pumps blood. It's, it's heart is something else. Um, we can try to figure out what what heart is, but it's uh, certainly not an organ. It's something else. Uh, but the problem is that there is a gospel method, uh, message technique, or uh, that people use to say, uh, uh, you need to ask Jesus into your heart. And there's nothing wrong with asking Jesus into your heart. Um, I mean, after all, it says right here that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, does come into our heart. But uh, is that how a person gets saved? Asking Jesus into their heart. Um, 
Now, some people would say that I'm maybe being a little pedantic and uh, scrutinizing it too, too much, but I believe that when we preach the gospel, we shouldn't be asking people to invite Jesus into their heart. Uh, I believe they, we should tell them the good news and tell them when they believe that, if they believe it with their whole heart, you can say that, uh, then they receive the Holy Spirit and salvation. Um, but it, if they don't understand that, if they just think they asked the, the ask to Jesus to come into their heart and don't understand the the gospel, uh, who Jesus is, how he accomplished his salvation, and that you get it when you believe it, uh, rather than thinking that uh, to to become a Christian you ask Jesus into your heart. Uh, so I, I do believe that the, this is one of the cases where I think we need to be precise and not misuse certain terms, even though. According to this verse here, it certainly is true. It's it's legitimate to say that this the spirit goes into your heart. But what is the heart, Renee or Cripps? It's the core of your being. You know, it's it's the the center of your being. It's your your mind. Your well, it's hard hard to explain. But I, I believe the heart, when it talks of in scripture, it's synonymous with the mind. What you believe in your mind is what you believe in your heart. Uh, it's, it's your whole being uh, believes something. It, it's something at the core of who you are. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. And this is a whole other subject. But, you know, the, the Bible refers to the heart as being deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Uh, and, and, and people use that to describe believers. But I, I don't think that's the that's who we are after we have the Holy Spirit. Uh, quote unquote, come, come into our heart, in, into our lives, uh, as Renee says, into the core of our being, uh, that starts to change. I, I believe the Holy Spirit starts to work on that, work on that evil heart. It, it's, it's definitely evil uh, because of the ravages of sin. But before there's accepting of the Holy Spirit, I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that that's not true. That is true. But then we have a different identity uh moving forward so i i think renee did a good job to explain it there's a lot of back and forth about this you know what's the spirit what's the soul what's the what's this what's that but that's the that's everything that we think everything that we're aware of our will and all that uh at the center of our being that's that's what gets changed our i believe our spirit gets sanctified immediately that the spirit man the spirit woman uh, is changed. And that's the part of us that, that Paul refers to that doesn't sin anymore. Doesn't that part of us does not sin? That's the, that's uh, the part that God changed immediately. Our soul is being changed. Uh, I don't mean we're being saved, as some people say, we're already saved. But that's that's the part that gets worked on. That's the part that w that we make a decision to walk in the spirit rather than the flesh. That part of us, at the core of our being, is is where the uh, Holy Spirit works. It's the it's our mind. The battlefield is in the mind. Uh, the, the spiritual battle is in our mind. And so that's the part that's being changed over time, I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I think we should all be able to uh, understand and, and believe that when it says heart, it's not talking about uh, the, the muscle, the organ, the heart. So, but it, it is important to understand what we, it means by heart. But when, when, uh, Philip said to the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, he, he asked Philip, well, now that I believe, is it okay to get baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with your whole heart. Uh, so what does it mean to believe with your whole heart? Uh, have you ever heard the expression that, uh, he, that his, his feeling was very heartfelt? Um, heartfelt. Uh, I believe that that just means that it was it was a real sincere uh, thing that was going on, uh, not something that uh, was, uh, you know, that is uh, questionable. It's absolutely sincere. He really believes. Uh, now, it seems to me that maybe it's being redundant and unnecessary because I, I think that believe should be enough. Believe by believing with your whole heart, because believing is um to me believing is an absolute thing there, there, there's let's say that there's a point where uh, you uh you step across this line and until you step across that line 
uh, you haven't, you're not on the other side of the line. Okay. So uh, you're not partial over the line. Doesn't, doesn't matter. It doesn't mean you're not over the line. So it's the same thing with, with believing you, you don't partially believe something. If you believe it, you believe it completely or else you're not really believing it. So uh, I don't know why it would be necessary to emphasize um, believe with your whole heart, but uh, I, the only thing I can uh, presume is that um, Philip was saying, yeah, if, if that's what you really believe, if you're really believing what, that this message, then yes, let's water baptize you. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think it's important that a person does believe. I think that's why Philip said it. I mean, I don't, I don't know his mind or heart at the time, but uh, to me, that'd be the only purpose of doing it. So he, he, if, if someone said that to me, someone said, if you believe with your whole heart, I would just take that to mean that I really believe it. That's it. Right. right. That, and, and you know, they use it, uh, Jason, uh, in scripture, it says some of the disciples we're having a hard time believing. And it said, oh, slow of heart to believe. So they changed their minds to mm -hmm. open their minds to understand. Mm -hmm. So see the heart and the mind were interchangeable there. Yeah. And it really is what you said. It's whether you believe it or not. You either believe something or you don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's true. Sadly, a lot of people claim and they believe what Christ did on the cross, but not really. No, no. They don't, no. They don't believe he did anything. It no. accomplished nothing. Especially if you're trying to, the, the, to me, the tell is if you're trying to add your own stuff to it. Yep. You're saying, well, I'm I'm living a good life. You know, I'm yep. being holy as he is holy. Yep. Well, you don't believe then what Christ did uh, 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 by himself without any help from you was enough. That's right. Because if you believed it, you wouldn't say, yeah, but. Yeah, there wouldn't be yeah, but. That's correct. But I, I think we would all agree, though, that my original point, that the idea of uh, um, uh, the spirit coming into your heart uh, or believing with your heart, that uh, this is, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, a people have taken this terminology and made it the means of salvation. Yes. Yes, and that's where yes. that's where the big problem arises. Is a person can invite Jesus into their heart, and but they they don't even understand what the gospel is or or, or believe it. But they just think, oh, I just need to ask Jesus to come into my heart. Right. They don't know who He is, what He accomplished, and what and what He's promised. You mm -hmm. got it. That is a big problem. A lot of people are trying to soul win mm -hmm. by telling people to pray a prayer to ask Jesus in their heart. But what the Bible says to do is to hear the message of what he did and suffered for you on Calvary and recognize your need for him, believe that he rose again and that gave you, died to give you the gift of eternal life, to trust him, to trust that he did that. So if he, if you do that and you do believe on him, then he does dwell within your heart. You don't have to ask him because we're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. So I, I think you're right. And that is a grave error in soul winning. And I think Dr. Hank Lindstrom, the predecessor for doc, Dr. Ralph Yankee Arnold, he said that was one of the biggest obstacles of soul winning and that he grew up trying to ask Jesus in his heart every week. And it, it was so confusing to him why he wasn't seeing any results because he really meant it. And he said, this is a, a great, great counterfeit um, that relies on emotionalism. You know, people think if they feel something or if they feel guilt or they feel warm, that, that that's proof that something happened. And it's very sad because you're right, Brother Luke. It takes away from the true way to salvation. The gospel is God's power into salvation for all who believe. And it's the only way for eternal life. It's the only saving message in the Bible. Well, we're also told that we have to ask forgiveness for our sins every day as if they weren't already forgiven. I've done yeah. that in the past. It's like, oh, forgive me for my sins. Well, he's already forgiven you for your That's sins. Right. The Bible says he has forgiven you all trespasses. Mm -hmm. You know, that doesn't mean if I if I do some huge sin that I that even I'm aware of that I that I you know don't address it with with father. That's right. 
but it means that I, I don't need to do it for forgiveness. I've already been forgiven. If I, if I really truly believed yep. with, with my whole heart, yep. then at that moment, our sins are all forgiven. Uh, all people don't problem. get this either. They think that we need grappling and begging God to for it's just ridiculous. Yeah, daily repentance is what they preach. Daily repentance every day. It should be Christ centered instead of us centered. And then you wouldn't even have to worry about saying because you're not thinking about it. Yeah, uh, sun conscious rather than sin conscious. That's right. Uh, all right, let's go to verse seven in the. Uh, KJV, and I think it's Renee. Is it no? Whose turn is it first? It's yeah. mine next. Okay, okay Crips. Okay. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Oh, praise God! No more a servant, but a son. Now Jesus uh, showed us how we are still servants, but I believe what Paul's saying is. He's making a distinction between who we were before and who we are now. We're instead of being his servants. Okay, the prodigal son is a, a good example. When he came to the end of himself and he he realized that uh, he was desiring to eat the the very slop he's feeding the pigs, and he thought in his mind, my my dad's servants get treated better than this. I'll go back to him and say, I've I, you know I've sinned and and just make me one of your hired hands. Because uh, he knew that was better. And his dad was having none of it. He he said, you're my son. Uh, so I think that's the distinction there. It's not saying we don't serve, that we're not servants in some way, but we're not uh, in the same category. I think this is about the, the category which Paul is referring to is that we're now sons. He also says heir of God through Christ. That that's the uh, that's the person that we get this adoption from or through is through what Christ did on the cross that makes us a son. Believing, believing with our whole heart, uh, we become a son rather than a servant. I think that one's pretty clear. You're muted, brother. All right. Yeah, this muting and not muting is uh, very. Uh... I have to say it's very frustrating. I, I'm muting on my mic because every time I mute on the board, then I've got to reset my whole screen up every single time. So that's why. It's, uh, well, let's just not do so, it. Let's just forget about it. Let's just do it the way we've been doing it. And if the well, video quality is off, it's, it's better to have that than to have it so cumbersome we can't hardly function. Yeah, I would only ask if you're going to cough or do significant shuffling that you mute then, but otherwise don't mute. But if you're going to be muted, you know, shuffling around or, you know, cracking up a Coke or something. Uh, yeah, I've, I've done that. And I apologize. I, I'll I, I'll be uh, more aware of that uh, now. So I apologize if I've uh, not done that. I used to be way more conscious of it. Maybe I'm not as conscious of it uh, mm -hmm. as I as I was. So I'll I'll, I'll be way more careful. Uh, keep my mic open unless I'm going to do any shuffling. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll do it this way. All right, Sister Renee, verse 7. Yeah, Brother Luke, I think the whole point of this is telling them, look, you, you are a son of God through Christ, not through the law. I mean, if you go back to chapter 3, it's like the law didn't, it, it was all to teach you something, and you should grow past that. You've now given the revelation that you are a son and joint heir with Jesus Christ. And so it's all by faith. You know, it's not by uh, these works of the law that he's fighting against. You know, the whole thing was foolish Galatians. Who's bewitched you? Mm -hmm. You know, the whole point is you are a son, a child, an heir. You have promises because God gave promises in Christ. And if you're in Christ by faith, they are yours. You don't have to do these carnal things. Don't do this. Don't eat that. Mm -hmm. you know, circumcised. That's the whole point he's trying to make to them. Good stuff yeah. for me. Yeah, uh, let me give you some applause because yeah. guess what we did? You you remind me of something that we need to emphasize. So I'll ask this question: uh, Who is Paul talking to? Saved or Hebrews? Yeah. What kind, of, what kind of what kind of people? Gentiles. S save Gentile believers, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's what, some, right. I'm assuming there were some Jews too. 
you know, yeah, 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 maybe, but primarily this is to save the Gentile congregation. Now, let's go back. Um, we're in verse seven, but let me say that, emphasize this in verse six for the point of this, this issue here. It says, and because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. Doesn't that settle the question? about if it is Galatians talking to believers or non-believers? Amen, Luke. I mean, if anybody's going to say that this is not talking about believers, yep. then what, all are gonna do, what are they going to do with this verse 6? And other verses, there's other verses we've cited like this, but this should clearly settle it. Doesn't yes. that settle the issue? And because you are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. So he's talking to people who are believers, and yet the whole purpose of the level the, the letter is telling these believers that they have gone apostate and now yes. fallen into a false gospel. Yes. So yes. If, if someone's going to say that it's impossible for a, a real believer to go apostate, that, that that's absolutely wrong. It's clear right here. He, this is talking to believers. There's many warnings. There's many warnings of saved believers having their faith shipwrecked, falling into error, being swayed to with every wind of doctrine, going back into uh, false uh, gospel messages. There's all kinds of that. It, uh, just because you're saved doesn't mean that you're not uh, able to be deceived. That's why he says always come back to the truth of Christ and his word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right, let me read verse 7 in the Amplified and before I comment. It says, therefore, you are no longer a slave, but that is a bondservant, but a son. And if a son, then also an heir through the gracious act of God through Christ. Um, really not much I can add to that. Uh, see if there's a... No. There's no footnote to be helpful, but let's go to the next verse. Then verse eight uh, says um, uh, in the KJV, how be it then when ye knew not God, ye did, ye did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. All right. Whose turn is it? Renee is up. Here, Renee. Right. So. How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them, which by nature were no gods. And this is clearly Gentiles. Who were the ones that worshipped false idols? Now, Israel, Israel did fall into that error many times. But he's talking about when they knew not God. These are pagans. How be it when you knew not God, you did service unto them, which by nature are no God. Mm -hmm. So he's clearly, uh, uh, stop it, Zeus, um, clearly talking to these former idolaters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And does, does this also add to the point that I just made? How be it then when ye knew not God, so before you didn't know God. Right. So there was a point where they didn't know God, but now, now he's saying, yeah, you come to know him. Right. You come to believe. You even got the spirit of God in your heart. Yep. This is clearly believers. I, I just wish people would, I mean, unfortunately, sometimes people get a doctrine and they're so committed to that doctrine that they have to, uh, the verses that clearly denounce that doctrine, uh, they have to be, somehow misinterpreted because because otherwise their doctrine is 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 proven wrong please let, let's let's be humble and if if we can if we should be able to recognize it if we if the scriptures are showing that we're wrong let's be teachable let's be correctable and, and say okay it's clearly talking to believers and these believers want to apostate well if we're not teachable then what does that make us that makes us dogmatic and it makes us arrogant and uh well, what's there's a better word for it than arrogant dull of hearing dull of hearing i mean that may be true that's not what i was thinking of it's another word uh, better than arrogance uh well arrogance works mm -hmm. um all right i let me see uh i'll read in the amplified uh, it says but at that time 
when you did not know the true God mm. and were unacquainted with him, you Gentiles were slaves to those pagan things, which by their very nature were not and could not be gods at all. Mm. Well, that's pretty good for the Amplified. That, that uh, uh, says it even more clearly uh, if you're trying to make the point about whether they're believers or not. Yeah. Well, and it also uh, confirms the point that we're made that this is referring to Gentiles here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and because I mean, we we get a clue when it's talking about the fact that they're uh, uh, they're believing in gods that are not gods. So that, that would be Gentiles or pagans. And then it clearly says it here in the in the Amplified. They were Gentiles. And you know what else, Luke? What? Uh, what's happening here? I, I want to remind everybody. What's happening here is these are Gentile, primarily Gentile ex-pagan believers and Jews are coming in, trying to bring them under bondage of the Levitical law of Israel. That's why he's even mentioning the law, because people came up behind him, Judaizers, trying to say, no, you've also got to keep the law of Moses and be circumcised. So this is why Paul's having this conversation to begin with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I mean, we've, I, I don't know how many times he's brought it up in all these studies of ours. He, he constantly brings it up or he brings up the fact that he's having to, uh, to reset teaching that he already set. And just go, go back over and say, uh, well, like you said, Renee, uh, uh, bewitched, who's bewitched you, you know? So that means they, they believe something and then they seem to have been influenced by someone on the outside. And I agree. It's uh, Judaizer. For sure. Mm hmm. Okay, uh, let's go to verse 9 in the KJV. Uh, it ends with a question. It says, But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? I mean, what is this saying? What it, what, go ahead. Please expound on that, whoever, whoever's turn it is. It's, it's my turn. Yeah. Uh, weak and beggarly elements. <laughs> so the verse above, he's talking about you did service uh, unto them, which by nature are no gods. So that, uh, you know, we've we've kind of pulled that out a little bit. So the Gentiles used to worship other gods that weren't gods. We know that. Uh, but now, Paul's saying, but now after you have known God or rather are known of God, uh, how turn ye again? So they're apparently turning back. He calls them weak and beggarly elements, whereunto you desire again to be in bondage. So you, you, you what's, what's happening here? In, in this one verse here, tell me what it has transpired. They they seem to be turning turning back to uh, former beliefs. Uh, and, and so, but but who are they again? Uh, they're Gentiles. Gentile what? Believers. Believers. Yeah. Believers who have turned ye again to weak and beggarly elements. Yeah. What does that mean? They are believers who have gone apostate. Mm -hmm. But I thought believers couldn't go apostate. I thought that was impossible. No, I think there are plenty of warnings about believers not falling into error. For, 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 for fear that someone thinks that uh, doesn't know uh, that was uh, sarcasm. Uh, <laughs> I I do know that is and that does happen. But well, there, read, there read are, the, sorry, there sorry. are there are some that are saying it, it's absolutely impossible for a real believer to ever go apostate. And this verse here clearly says that these are believers who went back to the weak and beggarly elements. Um, and put themselves back in bondage. That means they went to some pagan religious beliefs and, and uh, you know, maybe uh, got Judaized at the same time. Remember, uh, that's what was the initial problem was, is that uh, yep. the, the Judaizers would come in and he says, who hath bewitched you? Yep. Well, we know that it was uh, uh, the men that were coming in and teaching that uh, you got to follow the law. The Amplified does Sorry. Want, okay, you want a nine in the amplified? Uh, yeah, I've already I've already commented on it, but this really fills this in uh, too, I believe. Okay, uh, the amplified verse nine says now, however, 
since you have come to know the true God through personal experience, what, what kind of person is that? A Gentile believer. A safe believer. Yeah. In this case, Gentile. Yeah, or rather to be known by God, to be known by God. In other words, he's not saying, depart from me, I never knew you. Right. Yep. This is someone God knows as his own. Yep. How is it that you are turning back again to the weakened, worthless elemental principles of religions and philosophies to which you want to be enslaved all over again? Yep. All over again. Come on. Yep. Come on. It, it, it is. Uh, one of the things they were doing is trying to enforce the feast days. Feast days, Israel's feast days. Now, pagans had their own feast days, too. Uh, they, they would do things on the new moon. Uh, then we have Judaizers coming in trying to keep telling them you got to keep the Israel Sabbath day. These are elements. These are carnal ordinances, circumcision, food restrictions, feast days. This well, what's, is another, what's another word for a general term for for uh, going into these any kind of error? Apostasy. Apostasy. That's what it is. It's talking about. And regardless of what the details are, these people are apostate believers. Yep. And I, I don't know how anybody who could could read these verses we're talking about tonight and ever again say it's impossible for a saved believer to ever go apostate. That, first of all, making such outlandish um, uh, uh, declarations as absolute facts. In, uh, is a big mistake anyway. We should always guard against that. Uh, in, Brother Luke, yes. My pastor was so concerned for his grandparents because they were very religious and they were buried under years and years and years of tradition. They couldn't even tell you how they got saved. But when he finally sat down and got to the root of digging out all of that stuff, they were saved. They, they understood the gospel. They believed it. But because there was so much false teaching years and years in their churches, they got confused and had strayed away from the truth and the simplicity of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oops. Can you hear my fan? Yeah. That's it's, it's not bad, though. All right. It's minor. It's good. Okay. Wait till uh, we get to verse 20. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've got a real good answer for that, too. Okay, I'm waiting. But, but uh, okay. Um, <coughs> uh, let me see. What, what are we on now? Uh, verse uh, 10. Verse 10 in the KJV says, Ye observe days and months and times and years. Uh, okay, that's just more of the same. It's talking about the fact that they're become, become legalistic. Uh, verse 11, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Okay, whose turn is it? It's Renee. Yeah. Yeah, uh, he, he worked so hard to get them on solid ground. He leaves, and then Judaizers come in and confuse them and take them away from the simplicity of the gospel. And now they're starting to think, Oh, uh, I, I, I'm justified before God by my works now. Or there's something else I had to do. I got to also start keeping the feast days and be circumcised and yeah. all this other stuff. Yeah. Um, let's see. Is it, is it, which one did you stop on? 10 and 11, Renee. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so 10, 10 here it is. All right. Let's go back to nine. After you've known God or rather known of God, now turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, the, the carnal ordinances, whereunto you desire again to be in bondage. You observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you lest I bestowed upon your labor and pain. So again, now they've been sucked into probably keeping the Jewish feast days, the Old Testament feast days. Because the whole point here is that you can't be saved or even perfected in God's sight by fleshly ordinances of the Israel's Levitical law system. Right, right. Because that, that's the whole conversation he's having with them. None of that. All these Judaizers coming in and telling you, no, you're missing something. 
But Paul's trying to show him, no, you're already an, a joint heir with Jesus. You are a son by faith. You have the spirit of God in you by faith, not by works of the law. And so now it sounds like they're trying to start keeping probably the weekly Sabbath, the Passover, the you know all the Jewish feast days. They have uh, uh, crop things they have to do with the new moon, if you read. Right. It. So uh, they're probably doing that. In addition, the pagans had their own counterfeit feast days. So uh, it's possible they went back to them. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, uh, Paul is saying that he's concerned that all the work he put into them through the gospel, so that they would have peace and be secure that Christ did it all has been lost because they're, they're still under the assumption they've got to continually do this Old Testament ritual, earthly things, don't eat that, observe this day, all the Hebrew root stuff that's being promoted right now. Right. Uh, and, and, and that they lack understanding and all he's fearful that all the work, the foundational work of that church has been lost. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Crypt, did you take a turn on this yet or not? No, not yet. Go ahead and read the Amplified and then I'll... Uh... The Amplified verse 11 says, uh, I fear for you that perhaps I have labored to the point of exhaustion over you in vain. Uh, wait, I, I thought we were doing 9 and 10. Did I, did I miss something? Yeah, we did 10, 10 and 11. Okay, I, maybe yeah, I, I can put it back to nine. Sorry, sorry, Chris. Uh, no, that's okay. Uh, so, um, lest I have bestowed, so he's just he. Okay, he he could have said, "I'm afraid for you." I don't know why he says, "I'm afraid of you." I'm not. I'm not sure what that means. Lest I have uh, he he's saying, "I'm afraid." You know, it'd be like me saying I'm uh, to someone else. You know, I'm I'm afraid you've forgotten everything that I've taught you. That's what it seems like to me. Bestowed upon uh, you, uh, everything that Paul did uh, in his mind uh, could be in vain. He's not saying that it is in vain. Amen. I believe he's saying he's concerned. It, that's that's what I think he's saying there. It's not not saying that that they're somehow not saved anymore or they've completely gone over into this uh, new system um and i just wanted to see renee was setting this up saying about the feast days and verse 10 seems to be very clear about that they're observing these things and the only other thing i want to say was that i personally i don't think there's any problem if you want to keep the feast days keep the feast days you know paul makes that clear in other verses that there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're adding it to salvation, if, if you're believing that that somehow saves you, that's where the issue is. There's no problem to keep Passover if you want to keep Passover. Yeah. But and the, it's, it's wrong to enforce it right. upon others. Exactly. If, if you want to keep it because it has more meaning to you now because you right. understand it, that's great. You know, right. I have to do that. But right. it, it's gotten to the point where people are legalistic thinking it's pleasing God. Right. Same thing with Christmas. Uh, people that attack Christmas, I'm not going to go long into this, but it, 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 it's okay to, do, to celebrate Christmas, uh, especially you know what the true meaning is. Yep. Uh, it, it's the same thing. But as you mentioned, Renee, the Hebrew rooters, this is what they're doing. Yep. And in order to do that, they have to cast Paul right back out of the Bible. Yep. They have to ignore all of Paul's epistles in order to do that. Yep. You can't look at this. A Hebrew rooter can't look at this and say, well, that's not what he means. I mean, he's very clear, and all his epistles very clear about this stuff. Yeah, I've heard him twist it by saying, uh, let no man judge you on a holy day, meaning you need to keep them. No. Well, what? How does that come? But I've heard a twisting of that, and then other people, the Hebrew readers, just throw Paul out completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, some comments in the chat room, but I'd, I'd like to respond to Ben's comment here. It says, right, Paul fears for them, not of their salvation, but their continuance as a church that would be a faithful witness for the faith alone in Christ alone to the world. Okay, that, that, that's... Yeah. Oh, no. 
that's a valid point. I don't know if that's exactly 100% everything that's going on here, but that is a valid point. Now, my question is, uh, uh, is Paul saying anywhere in this letter that uh, I taught you the gospel and I thought you believed, but now that you've gone apostate and don't believe the gospel anymore, you must have never gotten saved. Is yeah. Paul, is That's... Paul ever saying that anywhere? No, no. No, he's not saying that. He's saying, declaring them as believers, he believes that they are believers. Yep. Now, Paul doesn't know any more than you or I can know if someone else is really a believer or not, but he's confident they're believers. But what he's really saying is Paul actually believes, as I do, that sometimes a real believer goes apostate. Yep. Right? That's what he's saying. Yep. He considers them real believers and they've gone apostate. So Paul believes a real believer can go apostate. Now, why well, is he doing that? Men shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils in the last days. Yes. I think it's possible. But, um, uh, so, so uh, but this believing, let me see, how is it phrased? Uh, uh, labor in vain. Uh, did, he, did Paul says, did I labor in vain? Okay, well, laboring in vain, it could mean, look, well, what would, Renee, what would you do if you had spent time uh, maybe a good amount of time. Matter of fact, he even said that, didn't he? Uh, er, earlier, he says, uh, "Yeah, we can." Uh, now that ye have known, or uh, where's it? Where's what verse is he talking about? Uh, how much he's labored? Uh, well, in the very beginning, it says it's as if Christ was crucified among you. You know, it was so clear the gospel had been preached so clearly to them. And all the work he had done in the church that somebody clearly had to have bewitched them after all the foundational work he had sowed into that church. Okay. Well, and, uh, some, at least in verse 11, he's talking about how he has labored. So, Renee, have you ever labored with someone, taken a lot of time to teach them the gospel and answer all their questions, and then they become a believer? And then what would you do? If if now they started going apostate and, and believed in lordship instead, what would you what would you, what would you would you feel like, man? I put all that time in. Now I've got to start all over with them to to, right. to make sure they get back to understanding and believe in the right way again. Right. But you're not gonna. You're not saying that. Oh, uh, you're not, you never did believe. Paul doesn't say that. Paul says no. But I honestly, Paul, I would in my gut say I wonder if they really understood it. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and that may be the case. There may be some people in this group here that never did believe. But the point is, uh, Paul is not saying, uh, well, since you are no longer believing believe in the gospel, it proves that you never really did believe it. He's, no, not, I, he's not saying that at all. He's, he's saying that you are real believers. You know God, and God knows you, and the Spirit of God is in you. Okay. And, yet, and now you're apostate. So Paul believes, as we do, that... Uh, someone who's got the Holy Spirit in them can f fall into legalism and apostasy. Yes. And so yes. the laboring in vain to me would mean that, dang, I, I put all that effort in, and now you're back where you were. Not lost, not lost, but you're you're apostate. I need to straighten this out. i got to start all over to straighten out your bad doctrine. Yep, and uh, I, I agree with Ben. If he doesn't straighten this out, the church can't be profitable in preaching the gospel because now it doesn't know what the gospel is. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's, uh, let's go to verse 12. Uh, okay. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Any significance to that term, what he calls them, brethren? Anybody there? Am I lost? Yeah, no, 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 I'm, I'm here. here. Sorry. And I was reading the verse you're talking about. Yeah, verse 12. I'm asking. He says, brethren. Yeah. Yeah, they're saved. 
Why would he call them? Why would he call them brethren if they? And remember, he's not calling them brethren as a fellow Jew. He's talking to a Gentile congregation, so the word brethren in this context means you're a believer. Right. Yeah. Saying brethren. I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me. Well, let me read. Uh, whose turn is it anyway? Verse 12. I don't know why. I, I can't remember whose turn it is tonight for some reason. It might be me. Well, go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, okay. Um, I think he's going on to the different subject now in a bit. I beseech you be as I am, for I am as ye are. You have not injured me at all, but it, it, it won't make much sense until I go forward. I can't really explain it until I, I don't want to give the next verse away. Well, I'll read the next one too. It says, ye know how through infirmity of the flesh, I preached the gospel unto you at the first. Yeah, apparently Paul did have some kind of illness, physical ailment. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, and I believe this does have something to do with his eyes. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think because there was a common common belief back then, and still today, that if you have something physically wrong with you, you're not really of God, or you're not blessed, or God doesn't love you, or He's punishing you for some sin or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All and right. So they they didn't injure him by accusing him of that. They accepted him with his frailty. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let me read 12 and 13 in the Amplified uh, Crips. It says, believer. Oh, look at that. <laughs> it, Amplified says the word that we say that this brethren means. He says, believers. These are believers. Come on, please. <sighs> believers, I beg of you, become as I am, free from the bondage of Jewish Ritualism. Gosh, oh, God. Crips, I can hardly contain myself, but it's your turn. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go. Ahead. I'll go after you. That's not a problem. Uh, okay. Believers, I beg of you, become as I am, free from the bondage of Jewish ritualism and ordinances, for I have become as you are, a Gentile. Okay, that makes sense, becoming a Gentile. That's how he became as they were. But what's um, profound about this is he, he's saying, look, you are believers. So that's settled. I have no doubt that you're believers. I, I'm calling you believers. You got the Holy Spirit in you. Now he says, I beg you, become as I am, free from the bondage of Jewish ritualism. These are believers who are believing in the false gospel. Mm -hmm. That's what this verse here is, is clearly saying. Mm -hmm. Be, but he, I want you to become free from the bondage of legalism, Jewish yeah. ritualism and ordinances. Uh, and he says, for I have become as you are, Gentile, which means Gentile means that they were never under the Jewish legal system. Right. 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 They never were. Yeah. And that's where another most most people in the church today, if you ask most professing Christians about the Ten Commandments and, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the laws of Moses, especially the Ten Commandments, they think the Ten Commandments were uh, applied to, to the whole world. Well, yeah, they're used as a witnessing tool. To, to tell people you ever lie, you ever cheat, you ever steal, you ever whatever. I yeah. mean, they're 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 used as a as a tool. Yeah. To get people yeah. Working. They also think that everybody, not just Israel, was given them, and they yeah. weren't. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Paul even says, "Hey, the the Gentiles, they never got the law, but they still knew murder was wrong. They well, still yeah. knew adultery was wrong. You yeah. know." Just it, the witness in themselves. Yeah. That God has given every person the knowledge to know what's right and wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some some things are are nestled into the way we're made. I mean, uh, yeah. Even a native would know that you know uh, on a, on a d desert island that's never seen civilization. I mean, they may choose to do it anyway, but they would know that murder is wrong or sleeping with some other so, someone else's yeah. wife is wrong. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Big, uh, in the uh, amp, the NABRE footnote in verse 12 says, because I have also become as you are, a terse phrase in Greek meaning, be as I, uh, Paul, am, uh, living by faith independent of the law, 
for in spite of my background in Judaism, I have become, as you Gentiles are now, a brother in Christ. Mm. So, uh, in other words, he's saying, you are not under the law, you're Gentiles. Now I've become a Gentile in that I'm not under the law either. So mm. I mean, that's clearly saying that the Gentiles are not under the law. They never were. Yep. Right. right. Okay. So, so don't put yourself, Paul's saying, don't put yourself back back in bondage you were in bondage before that's the verse uh, we uh, wow. went over at the beginning so don't put yourself back under the same bondage that you're free from be free like i am mm -hmm. yeah now the injuring part you guys i thought it might have been in reference to them accepting him with his frailty that they have not injured him they received him uh in his frail plate and still accepted him as a servant of god but uh, I don't know. Is there another context about them not being injured by the law? No. Or I'm not sure. Well, let's go ahead a little bit and see if we can figure it out. In the remaining time, I think we can get through a couple of verses that pertain to that. So it, uh, verse 13, uh, ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. 14, and my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despise not, nor rejected but receive me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Uh, I'll read verse 15. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Mm. Right, Brother Cripps? Yeah, I, I think he he's, uh, I think Renee's, Correct. It's he's ta he's talks about infirmity all the time. He talks uh, not just about his own, but infirmity. Uh, well, yeah, he's referring to his own infirmities. Uh, you knew how through infirmity of the flesh I preached gospel. So that obviously there was something going on, and uh, he uh, they apparently treated him well. They treated treated him uh, in a graceful manner. So verse uh, fifteen. Where is then the blessedness you spoke of? In other words, they're moving away from that. This is the point that he's making, moving toward these other things. For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. So, uh, yeah, if it had been, I think this is probably where people get the idea that it, it uh, potentially an eyesight problem of some sort, and that they, they uh, treated him so well that if that were possible, they would have done that. So now I think that's in contrast to how they're acting now. I think that's what he's reacting to because they're moving away from everything, uh, all the attitudes that they had before when they understood that they were free. Mm -hmm. So you're going back under law. That changes everything. You put yourself back into bondage. It changes everything. Mm -hmm. I believe it does. I, I, and, and I'll just say one more thing because I have a friend and I mentioned this before that went in back uh, under under bondage, under the law, Hebrew roots. That, that's what he, he went to, Hebrew roots. I used to love his posts. They were so, uh, so um, uh, intelligent and interesting and used scripture and all that. And now I can't stand him. He has changed. Everything about him has changed because he put himself back under bondage. What, what preacher is that? What's that? Was that a, is that a preacher you're talking about? No, not a preacher. Just, just. Oh, okay. He, I think he considers himself a preacher, but no, he's he's technically not a preacher. He, he acts like one. He acts like uh, people are sitting on the edge of his seat with all his posts. Mm -hmm. um, but now that he's under Hebrew roots, his, the whole uh, tenor of his posts have completely changed uh, uh, from what they were before he went back in, uh, under the law. My, my point is when you go back under the law, this is what Paul... I believe he's saying, uh, based on his infirmity and the way they treated him at the beginning, when when they had a better understanding, or at least seemed to understand grace, and now they, they're treating him differently, and so he's using this as an example. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sister Renee, uh, th 13, 14, and 15? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, yeah, it's a, he preached the gospel when he first, my temptation, which is my flesh, he despised not, so they didn't hold it against him, that he was having uh, health issues, uh, and I agree with him, where's the blessing that you speak of, I bear your record, if been so they've always treated him with kindness, even uh, in the state of uh, 
his frailty. Uh, but, well, I can't really say more. I'll wait till we go to the next. Well, wait till verse 16. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to read those three verses in the Amplified and then comment uh, 13, 14, and 15 in the Amplified. On the contrary, you know that it was because of a physical illness that I remained and preached the gospel to you the first time. And even though my physical condition was a trial to you, you did not regard it with contempt or scorn and reject me, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus himself. What, what then has become of that sense of blessing and the joy that you once had from your salvation and your relationship with Christ. For I testify of you that, if possible, you would have torn out your own eyes and given them to me to replace mine. Well, um, well, I'd say that uh, this idea of um, a re you received me as an angel of God um, you know, there were times when people um, wanted to worship Paul and and uh, Peter, and and, uh, and they had to say, "No, I'm just a man like you. Uh, I'm not to be worshipped." But uh, this angel of God, uh, maybe they, maybe they, maybe they thought he was an angel, or maybe the word angel should be understood as messenger because yeah. that's what it really means. Yeah, I think you're right, Luke. I I agree with you on that. I, I think mm -hmm. that they accepted him as a messenger from God, someone God sent. I think mm -hmm. that's all that means. Yeah. And I, I think the idea of him being sick and then giving them, them being willing to give their own eyes for Paul uh, is an indication that he, this illness he had was uh, losing his eyesight or, and, and that they were willing to, they loved him so much they would be willing to give their own eyes to help him if they need, if he needed them. Uh, let, uh, let's look at the See if there's any footnote on this part. Um, 14, 14, 50. Uh, uh, verse 13, physical illness, and this is in the NABRE footnote. Because its nature is not described, some assume an eye disease, uh, others epilepsy. Some relate it to uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. Originally, this may also be translated formally or on the first uh, two visits. Uh, and then verse 15, the footnote is, the blessedness of yours, uh, possibly a reference to the Galatians' initial happy reception of Paul and of his gospel and their felicitation at such blessedness. But the phrase could also refer ironically to earlier praise by Paul of the Galatians no longer possible when they turn from the gospel to the claims of the opponents. Um, if the word is a more literal reference to a beatitude, it may be in view. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I guess I don't have anything to add any further on that. Shall we read the last, the last verse here that you wanted to comment on, 16? Uh, yeah, so. 16 in the KJV, and then this will be where we'll finish. It says, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Yeah. So it, it, we're trying to trying to figure out what Paul's purpose is uh, of going through all this. And I, I feel like verse 16, their treatment of him has changed. That's why he brings up in verse 15 the way things had been before and, and 14. The way that he was received, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. So then we move to verse 16. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? He told them the truth in the beginning and they treat him, treated him wonderfully. And then these people come in and they're trying to get him back under bondage. So to me, it means that they're they're uh, they're they have changed. That's why he's in in fear of them, quote unquote, because they've changed and they're going back under bondage. And he's. Uh, very concerned about it. And he's using their treatment of him as an example of, of what he's recognizing. Uh, and, and that falls in line with what I've seen people that go back under the law again. It, it changes the whole spirit of, of a person, I believe. It changes the way that they react to things. Uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're free under grace and you understand 
the incredible gift that God's given you and you believe it and you accept it and you understand it, it does affect the way that you live. It affects the way that you view other people. It affects how much you love someone else. If you go back under the law and you're scrutinizing every, everything and you're not any longer under the idea of grace, it changes who you are. So I believe that they're headed that way and Paul's concerned about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sister Ray? Yep, I agree. Uh, well, one thing we do see changing here besides the obvious uh, that they had fallen away from the simplicity of the gospel and started getting in, uh, corrupted by Judaizers trying to bring them under the law and weak and beggarly elements, keeping carnal things, worrying about things of the flesh, what to eat, certain days, things of the earth, right. and spiritual things. These are very carnal. People don't get it because it seems to have like a a, a wisdom to it, a spirituality to it, but it's actually not. It's actually very carnally minded because those in the flesh, they mind the things of the flesh. That's why they're still minding food ordinances and feast days because they're minding things of the flesh. Right. That's what they do. And so um, here uh, when he says, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? He, he's telling them they are in error. They have fallen away from the truth. He is fearful that all the work he put into them is gone to waste because they were quickly he said so soon removed from me who called you unto the grace of Christ and to another gospel, and not another. So um, his bluntness about how far from the truth they had come and why it's horrific error uh, is probably not good for them to hear. But he's reminding them of, of his affection for them and their affection for him when they were standing in the truth. And I agree with uh, uh, Crips there because it does change people. It turns them self-righteous for one. Self-righteous and or fearful and carnally minded instead of spiritually minded. Mm. So. Uh, and ironically, it seems so spiritual. It's not, you know. Um, so I, I think he's just saying, you know, what I'm saying might sound harsh, but I'm not your enemy. I'm telling you this out of care for you. You know, he he has to be blunt by telling them how, how far away from the truth they've gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all I will say about uh, that verse 16 is uh, this is what we've all experienced um, when, when we uh, do the same thing Paul's doing, correcting someone and telling them the truth that they are, they have a false gospel. Uh, that I'm not, I don't want to be your enemy. Don't think of me as your enemy. I'm just trying to tell you the truth for your, your own good. So uh, we we've all gone through that ourselves. It's, we have so much in common with Paul because we we have we share his gospel. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, we're we're done with the the verses, but um, I think we ought to take just a minute and, and let, if we can do it very very concisely, because someone's concerned in the chat room about First John one nine. So I know we've talked about this numerous times in the past, and it, it could take an hour, but I, I, can we take just a minute? And I'll, I'll start off by telling you, if you're listening in the chat room now and you're concerned about 1 John 1, 9, and you think of it as some kind of requirement for salvation, and some say it's a requirement for fellowship, the way I see it is um, um, I believe that uh, that portion of scriptures is um, is like right now everything we've been talking about tonight is we're in a church program where we're, we're assuming we're talking to believers, but it, when you have a church program, you have to realize that maybe there's somebody listening now, maybe there's somebody in in the audience in a pew, if you have a local church, that's not saved. So we, you need to understand, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you. But if you confess that you are a sinner, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. That's just 
uh, the part of the scripture, the first John, where it's, it's talking to the non-believer for a moment, saying, hey, that you understand you're, everybody sins and you need to confess that you're a sinner and, 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 and believe and get righteousness. So I, I don't think that should be used as a um, legalistic thing, a, a method yep. to, uh, to try to get in good standing with God over and over again. Uh, if a person wants to confess their sins to God as a believer, um, God, I don't think God is uh, cares. Uh, God knows your sin. He, you don't, you don't have to confess it to tell Him. He's aware. He's aware of all the sins you have can't even remember. So if you had to confess all your yeah. sins, you couldn't even remember all your sins. So yeah. you could, you, you'd fail in confessing all your sins if that was required. But if you want to confess your sins because to get it off your conscience and get it get it out. You know, if it makes you feel better, you can do it. But I wouldn't put any faith in it for salvation, and I wouldn't put any faith in it to um, restore fellowship. Because in the prodigal son uh, parable, uh, the father didn't leave fellowship with the son. He was always waiting with open arms. It was the son that left fellowship with the father. So God, you're always in fellowship with God's always in fellowship with you, even though you're, you you still sin. And uh, if you want to confess your sins, it's going to make you feel better. Do it. But I, I hate to see people putting yep. themselves under legalism, thinking they they got to keep confessing their sins. Otherwise, God got uh, out, out of fellowship with them. Hey, there's a bigger issue here, Brother Luke. Why? Because I fear that Thomas doesn't understand that salvation is a one time event. And so uh, I agree with Brother Luke on this one. He's discussing how some people think they're not sinners and don't need a savior. And John's like, no, if you say you have not sinned, you deceive yourself. The truth's not in you. But if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. This is clearly saying you've got to admit you're a sinner and come to Christ as Savior. That's all there is to it. But uh, the issue here is it's a one-time event. Jesus already died to pay all your sins. All he asked you to do is believe he did that so that you could have eternal life. That is the gospel message. And if you're fearful that you've got to remember all your sin and confess them, you don't understand what the gospel is. The gospel is that Jesus already saved you. All he asked you to do was trust that he did it for you. And then you can begin your walk with him. So uh, it, it, a lot of people think that salvation is an ongoing thing. you got to confess. And if you forget a sin, you won't get to heaven. We don't even know how much we sin every day. There's a sin of apathy and fear and jealousy and all. I don't even focus on sin. I focus on Jesus and who he says I already am in him. And that's just how I live. I don't go around beating myself up and look, did I sin today? You can't live that way. That is the law. That is bondage. That is not how we're supposed to live. But hopefully I, I have so many uh, videos and so does Luke on the gospel the the saving message is what jesus did for us and you either believe he gave you eternal life because he paid all your sin all of it you didn't exist when he was crucified all your sin was future his blood is forward and backwards from the cross because he died once for all perfecting us forever and so that really is the good news of the gospel. And people have made it so complicated. So I hope you understand it's not some process. It's not based on you constantly confessing. God knows what we do. He knew our sins before we did them. They were put on Jesus. So um, just keep, you know, keep researching. Uh, look at the videos on the saving message of the gospel. And then once you've trusted in the spirit dwells in you, he will help you start understanding other things. That is a process. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you addressed that, Brother Luke. All right. Uh, okay, let's give our uh, Crips. Did you want to say anything about that before we do our closing remarks? No, I, I think it's I think it's been addressed. No problem. Okay. All right then. All right, Brother Crips, uh, give us your summary, please. Yeah, it was a great uh, study. I'm glad we uh, addressed uh, who Paul was talking to. I, I feel like that's uh, been made very clear and what he's talking about, uh, what the condition is of the Galatians. Uh, I, I think um, 
I think uh, we're, we're correct in what he's trying to address, that they're going back under, like, the, for example, the feast days and all that, because that's mentioned, that they're, that they're going back into bondage and how important that was. And again, I've said this hundreds of times probably, uh, but the reason why he was talking about it and it was a problem back then is because it's still a problem today. Uh, and I believe that's preserved in Scripture for that very reason, so that we can look at these things today, we can realize uh, uh, if we get to a point of what we're concerned about these things, we can look at Scripture and we don't have to listen to a man or a woman that's that, that's preaching some false gospel. We can go right to Scripture and see it for ourselves. Um, but fortunately, there are some people out there that are still preaching the right gospel. Uh, so just trust trust His Word, trust His Spirit. Um, you know, you're sealed. You're sealed. If, if you believe with your whole heart and you've accepted salvation, you're sealed. You can't you can't lose it. You can't. Uh, but but. Uh, it, it seems clear to me that a believer can go into apostasy. Otherwise, uh, why would uh, Paul call them brethren? So there's some um, very interesting things in this one. I look forward to next week, uh, and I hope everyone has a, a good rest of their week, too. Thanks in the chat. Okay. Thank you, brother. Uh, all right. Sister Renee, give us your summary, and then what, what are you doing tomorrow night on your program? Yeah, man. It was uh, it was good to be back with you guys. I uh really get thrown off guard when I get off my schedule here. Um, well, uh, I, I love Galatians so much, and I'm kind of grieved I missed any of it, because this this book is the best defender for salvation by grace alone. Um, but, uh, oh, tomorrow night, uh, on um, following up with this week's Thursday Theological Throwdown, uh, I was out of town last week for my birthday, so we didn't have it. Uh, and Sister Lisa had a death in her family. So, uh, but she is going to be with us as well as Brother Ben. It'll be uh, Sister Lisa from For the Most High Jesus channel and Brother Ben, the producer of this program. And I think Cody might join. But we are going to be discussing the media campaign against Christianity against the divinity of Jesus and against Christians. Because I'm seeing so many movies and TV trying to turn Christians into hater, intolerant, and even psycho killers. They got a new movie out where these people are killing people and making it look like satanic ritual murder so they can blame Satan to convert them to Jesus. Wow. It's really messed up. And they're showing preachers being hypocrites that are money hungry and sexually deviant. Like every Christian character on network television is horrible. There's never like a real Christian that really loves the Lord. It's always uh, we're evil, terrible. Like I'm telling you, this campaign has really ramped up. So we're going to talk about the campaign against Christianity and Christians in the media lately and people are believing it uh and i think this is going to be fueling persecution soon uh people over in china i got a picture of a, 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 a probably a 60 year old woman beaten half to death face all bloody as they sent her into an internment camp in china because she was a christian and refused to renounce christ so this stuff's happening right now in the world and we need to be aware that there is a campaign against us and I think it's more important than ever to live godly and loving because we really need to step up and be a light to the world and, and be more selfless and more loving and tell people about the love of God because there's so much campaign against Jesus and Christians right now. People really need to see through all that nonsense. So that's what we're going to be talking about tomorrow night. And I hope to see you there. It's 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Renee Rowling channel. All right. Thank you. All right. Brother Ben, would you give us a summary? Well, you guys definitely did disappoint tonight. And uh, I liked how everyone took a strong stance on the, uh, I believe, a serious doctrinal error where it says that, you know, whoever believes if they believe truly then they will never stop believing uh, i think that's serious issue for I, I believe that people believe that are true brothers and sisters 
but I do believe it's it's an error uh, and it's it's just a barely tolerable error in my opinion. Um, but I do consider them brothers and sisters, and I think it's a serious error for a couple of reasons. One is it uh, discouraging; it's it's discouraging as opposed to encouraging and edifying. And number two, uh, I believe it leads to serious um, uh, misinterpretation of scriptures that warn true believers like Galatians that anyone can fall into doctrinal error and that we should be watching out for each other constantly to make sure that none of us are falling into false doctrine. And so I believe Galatians, uh, Hebrews, without a shadow of a doubt, uh, Second Peter, uh, Jude are all books that are warning of, to believers of, of falling into some kind of error. Uh, either whether it be at the ditch of legalism or the ditch of license. Um, but I, I loved how uh, you guys all took a strong stance on that. And uh, that was really great. So I'm uh, looking forward to the next one. All right. Amen. Thank you, brother. Um, yeah. I, I, it, it's something that bothers me a lot, too. And, and that's why when I see the verses in this particular um, portion of scriptures we discussed tonight, that so clearly show us that that's a false uh, uh, teaching, that uh, the teaching that if you're truly saved, it's impossible to ever go apostate or have a, any crisis of faith. So um, that, that's, that's a false teaching. I'm sorry. And uh, this, these scriptures tonight, clearly, uh, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about real believers. It couldn't be any, expressed any more clearly. And if anybody wants to deny that, then they're they're just they're denying clear scriptures. Uh, now, thank you everybody for uh, um, participating tonight. Uh, uh, don't forget to join Renee tomorrow night, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern on her channel, but also join us Friday night on this same channel for a fun fellowship Friday night. So look forward to seeing you all there. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.